Welcome to the Possibility Action Network podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Middleton, a.k.a. Possibility Man. We're committed to bringing you guests who strive to better people's lives and serve as a force for good in the world. Our guest today is Abigail Gimpel. She has a passion for working with children diagnosed with attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, commonly referred to as ADHD. She helps them understand, well, helps them and their parents understand the diagnosis and reminds them that people living with ADHD can heal and flourish. Abigail is the author of two books, including Hyperhealing, Show Me the Science, Making Sense of Your Child's ADHD Diagnosis. Abigail, welcome to the show today. Stephen, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. What an honor that you invited me on. Well, you know, as a podcast host, as, a, as I mentioned to you, we were chatting a moment ago, you just kind of know when there's someone that you want to talk to. And when I saw you, I knew that I want to have this conversation with you. But first, I want to remind our listeners and our viewers, follow, like, and share this podcast wherever you find it. Your support matters and makes a difference. Abigail, you know, I talk to people literally all over the world. So I'm just curious, where are you in the world today? Right now, I am living in the Judean hills of Israel. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful place. Aha, uh -huh, fantastic. Okay, so look, what was your work? I mean, I know what you do now. You, you're a teacher, you're a coach, you're a consultant. But what was your work before you're doing what you do now? So I started out as a teacher in an inclusion classroom. That's a, that means it's for kids with uh, regular abilities and kids with uh, different types of challenges, all put into the same classroom. I'm a special educator, so I was tasked with uh, taking care of these fabulous, fabulous kids. And uh, that's when I actually met and fell in love with ADHD because uh -huh. it was those those students, I, I taught in an Orthodox Jewish school, and it was an all boys school. And it was those boys that I couldn't get their attention at all during during the classroom studies. But during recess, they'd circle around me and ask me questions and were fascinated with everything. And, and they just drew, drew me in, I needed to understand how to be able to educate them. Yeah, I tell you what, just from what you've just said, I would say that you have a heart for it. Uh, and usually people who have a heart for it were given a gift. And your gift is to work with people from various backgrounds. That's that's awesome. So now, um, what is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD? What is that? So if we looked into the DSM, it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is really the Bible of psychiatry. Uh, not my favorite book on the planet, but they would <laughs> have a, a basic description of ADHD, with, which would be a difficulty with focus, with concentration, children who can't follow through, who kind of break into conversations when adults are talking, have a hard time sitting for a long time. Then we also have the inattentive ADHD, which would be the kids that would be the more of the dreamers. But generally what we're seeing is kids that have trouble with uh, behavior, with academics, with sitting in class, with keeping up with what's going on around them. And uh, oh. I, I, of course, um, do not refer to ADHD as a disorder. I refer mm. to it as ADHD symptoms, meaning that the DSM wow. list that we have, and uh, we're up to the DSM-5, so everyone is welcome to go check out what the list is of symptoms, but it really is just a list of symptoms, and we, we cannot, at this point, science has not brought us to a place where we can actually call it a disorder. Uh-huh. Okay, but but it is but it is referred to as a disorder by Absolutely. some people. Uh -huh. Okay, so what is it like? Have you been around a child or the parents of children who have been diagnosed, and what is it like for them to be told that they have, you know, ADHD? Well, it's interesting you ask me that because of my six children. God bless them. And I can't say anything about my grandson yet because he's only two weeks old. But of my six children. All six of them were diagnosed with ADHD, as well as my husband. So when you ask if I've been around children like that, I'm like, yeah, that's my entire life is being around people with ADHD. And mm -hmm. uh, 
And your question really is about receiving the diagnosis. So that really brings me back to that young lady that you just met who was helping me with the lighting, um, my oldest, Aliza, who was diagnosed when she was in second grade, very bright, very energetic, a fun kid to hang out with. And when I took her into the doctor's office, we had been having a fabulous time in the waiting room, really just having fun, talking to each other. We, we just love spending time with each other. And we go into the doctor's office and the doctor presses on the print button because she had to print some some form out for a previous a patient. And my daughter hears the 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 woo of the of the printer and leaps out of her seat, runs to the printer, hands the document to the doctor, thinking that she's fabulous because she just was so yeah. helpful to the doctor. And the doctor looks up at me for the very first time and says, Mrs. Gimpel, slam dunk ADHD. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. what does that mean? So she, and obviously I knew what ADHD meant because I'd already been a classroom teacher for a while and had worked with kids with special needs as well. So it wasn't foreign to me, the 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 uh, concept, but I had never seen this kind of diagnostic process. And not only that, she went on to say, okay, well, and what that means is that your child's brain works differently than the brains of other children. And therefore, in order to correct that, she's going to need this prescription. Any Ooh, questions? Okay. And I'm like, yeah, I've got like 40,000 questions. Like none of what you said just now made sense to me. But honestly, walking into the office with this adorable, fabulous kid who I just thought was like, you know, really the best kid on earth. And then walking out of there slumped down, having been told that my kid was broken and that her brain was broken was devastating. Yeah. Uh, wasn't that, was was that a leap <laughs> on the doctor's <laughs> part to go from the child is handing her a piece of paper to, whoa, there's a doctor. Was that a leap of some sort? So that's a super excellent question. And the truth is, I didn't give you a tiny bit of the background. The background uh -huh. is that the diagnostic process begins with questionnaires that the parent uh -huh. and the teacher fill out. So before the doctor met my daughter, she first had read the questionnaires and it's just a scale how likely is your daughter to sit in her seat for, or, or the student to sit in their seat for more than 10 minutes from one to five. So the dot, the teacher had already indicated that my daughter had clearly more energy than the other kids in the class and was definitely having a hard time with organization. So therefore the doctor really did not feel any need to investigate further. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. that's the part that was really messed up with this process whereas right. she didn't take any interest in my daughter and because of the dsm category with all of the criteria she didn't have to because according to if you get you check enough boxes that equals this is your diagnosis and there's uh -huh. no reason to really dig further and ask why why is a yeah. child being that way how did yeah. we get to broken brain yeah yeah so as a parent not as a coach, how okay. did you feel when when the doctor said that to you? I, I was destroyed. I was mm -hmm. destroyed. I was a young mom and uh, this was the light of my life. And and I, I was absolutely destroyed. The doctor had so much power and she had literally oh. cursed my child. And, oh. and when mm -hmm. someone in authority curses your child, I actually spent some time on that in my book about talking about curses. I don't mean she used a profanity. Yeah. I meant she said, what I mean is from a place of authority and we all believe doctors, we trust doctors right. and, and that's what we're trained to do. And so from this place of authority, she had declared my child broken yeah. and you can't argue with that. And that becomes your gospel. That becomes your mm -hmm. truth. And yeah, uh, yeah. so I, and it took me a couple of years to get back on my feet and say, are you sure? Is that the yeah. whole story? But immediately I said, oh, goodness, we've got it. We've got to fix this. Even though in my heart, I knew that that wasn't correct. But it's very yeah. hard to disagree. Yeah. Now, how, what's your daughter's name once again? What's your Her daughter's name is Aletha. Aletha. So how Aletha. old was Aletha? Aletha. How old was, her, was she when she received this news? So she was uh, seven years old. Seven years old. And, uh, you know, did she understand what the doctor was saying and in your conversations, how did she feel? That's a great question because I I don't remember how she felt. Uh -huh. All I remember is that we immediately in the family did not, we decided spontaneously, my husband and I, not to 
call it ADHD, not to refer to a disorder. And we immediately went over to what's what we call to this day, special energy. And, yeah, and that I, like that that. I like that. If there. <laughs> yeah. And my husband grew up before ADHD was in style, before it was mm -hmm. a thing. And mm -hmm. uh, for him, because he's got excess energy. I mean, he could do more than anybody else I've, I've ever met in a day. If, mm -hmm. if I'm tired at midnight, uh, after, you know, getting up at six in the morning and running through the day with incredible busyness, he'll look at me and say, well, you should check your iron. And I'm like, mm. no, I'm actually a regular person and we get tired at night. He doesn't do that. But when he was mm. growing up, he really, his experience was, I'm Superman. Everyone yeah. else so he struggled in class. He had to paint a, a, a shape of his shoes on the floor so that he'd remember where to put his feet. So he struggled for sure, but when he got out on the on the ball field, when he when he was out socially, he was Superman. So we yeah. were able to kind of to direct that message to our children. You know, I love that, Abigail, because you know you can either look at it and say, "Well, I'm broken," or you can say, "This is a superpower." You know, yeah. I'm Superman. I like that. Well, who else would say that other than possibility of man? <laughs> exactly. So, so, yeah, we're yeah. totally aligned, you and I. <laughs> hey, look, so let me ask you, um, you know, with someone, you know, just saying or uh, confirming a diagnosis because of the child's behavior, this seems to me that there are opportunities for a lot of misdiagnoses. Mm -hmm. Do you think that happens as well? So this is actually where I began doing my deep dive into ADHD because of that oh. very question, because I'm looking at it and I'm saying, hmm, we've got a checklist and we're, we're checking off some boxes and then we're giving this lifelong diagnosis that may require psychiatric drugs. Is there something oh. we're missing here? And I'm thinking to myself, let's say someone has tightness in their chest. Yeah. Do we immediately assume it's a heart attack. Or do we investigate? Is there any curiosity there to try to find out what's going on? I remember watching a movie where someone was having pain in their chest and the doctor, like this small, small town doctor, whoever knows this movie, I, I don't completely don't remember the name of it. The small town doctor opens up a can of Coke and gives it to the guy. He was like having some, I don't know, some, some kind of um, acid and, and, and the pain just went away immediately. So there, that's my point. My point is that when we have a physiological problem, we try to investigate, we're curious, we try to find out. Yeah. But when it comes to these psychiatric diagnoses, we lose curiosity. We're told what it is, and then we believe it. And that's where I said, mm -hmm. something's wrong here. We're not seeing the child. And mm -hmm. so then what I discovered was that this list of symptoms actually could be caused by many, many different things. Mm -hmm. And if we go straight to the brain, which is the least likely cause, of ADHD symptoms, we're missing the child. So it's not even a false diagnosis issue, it's an abusive child issue. Because let's yeah. say, God forbid, the child had been abused, neglected mm -hmm. uh, in any way, gone through trauma. Uh, you know, there's, there's children live in war zones or, or their parents have gotten divorced. Uh, other things that children go through, they can't hack the stress. They will have the exact same uh, symptoms as a child who did not go through that stress, but has an instant gratification personality or doesn't have enough sleep or is addicted to screens. So what yeah. we're doing is this one, one fix for everything. And yeah. in most cases, we're not actually helping the child overcome the symptoms. Uh, you know, that's a powerful message to parents, what you just shared. You know, even if the doctor, you know, jumps the gun, the parent need to be strong enough to say, wait a minute, let's look at this more, more carefully, uh, for sure. So um, I would imagine, Abigail, that there are people who may have AD, this superpower, you know, and, and not know it. Is that is that possible to, or, or, you know, or is it the other that we'll know that something is going on? Are there undiagnosed children in this case, or parents were going to know something is going on? So what we're seeing is that girls are underdiagnosed because mm. girls will definitely present more of the dreamy side. So they're kind of missing out on the classroom, what's going on. They're looking out the window. They're planning their future without actually any real direction. And uh, and they don't bother the teacher. 
the reason why ADHD is way overdiagnosed in boys and, and girls are getting or catching up, unfortunately. The reason it's so overdiagnosed is because these kids bother their teachers. And what's mm-hmm. happened when I started teaching before Ritalin was a big thing. So yeah. we had to learn how to discipline. It was like this, this like brilliant thing that we knew how to do in a classroom, which was without yelling, without being nasty, we knew how to help our students focus throughout the lesson. But mm-hmm. the minute Ritalin became the solution, when I say Ritalin, I mean the whole class of drugs yeah, yeah. for ADHD. Yeah. And when that became the solution, uh, teachers kind of turned on the parents and said, what are you doing? Your child is struggling in class. Your child is blowing up the classroom. Your child's suffering. Give your child what he needs. It's like glasses. Mm. You wouldn't mm. hold that glasses from your child. It's a false narrative because it's yeah. not like glasses. And Ritalin yeah. doesn't repair uh, the uh, certain behaviors. It just masks right. it for a couple of hours. But the point is that we're not over or under diagnosing. We're completely misdiagnosing. But there mm-hmm. are a lot of forums of women and girls that say we should have been diagnosed and we were yeah, missed. Yeah. yeah. Well, you gave me, you gave us a lot there. So I'm going to spend a little more time with that. You mentioned girls being on the dreamy side, and that brings me up thinking about the the types of you know, attention deficit, uh, HD, ADHD. Are there different types? And and what are the main types, would you say? I would think dreamy is one of them because you brought it up. What are some yeah. of the others? So we have the inattentive and the hyperactive. And in my opinion, yeah. the only reason that these, that ADHD is kind of lumped together is because both of them could be treated with the same drugs. Mm-hmm. Meaning that they, they you, you take a kid who's dreamy, Sitting in the class, and by the way, my girls are are way of the hyper kind. We we did not mm-hmm. we did not do dreamy with anybody okay. in my family, which is a very strong hyper. Um, so it's not an absolute that girls are going to be one way and boys are going to be the other. It's all mixed. It's just majority boys are going to be more hyper, majority girls are going to be mm-hmm. of the more dreamy. But it's two separate animals completely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, often they need a completely different kind of intervention program. Whereas one might be reserved and a little self-conscious and and scared of social interactions, the other is going to be way over social and too dominant in, in social situations. But since both of these types of kids can be treated with the same drug to all the adults' uh, enjoyment, uh, therefore it was thrown together. If there were two separate drugs, then it would have been two different disorders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You um, also mentioned that, you know, boys and girls, boys are more likely to be identified because of the behavior part. Girls tend to be more submissive. So I'm I'm glad you put that up there. But let me ask you this. What about cultures? Are there cultures that, are are there any uh, distinctions among cultures, if you follow what I'm saying? Sure, absolutely. And that's really interesting because I have had the benefit of starting my life in New York. And Uh I'm a proud New Yorker to this day. And uh, then I lived in Moscow in Russia for a couple of years, and that's an unpopular thing to admit. And now I'm living right outside of Jerusalem. I think that's also unpopular to admit nowadays. But uh, either way, I so I've actually gotten to visit different cultures. And uh, I would say that the my most familiar, which is the New York American Jewish culture, we're obviously uh, not not necessarily Jewish and mixed Mm. mixed cultures. I've, I've taught in many racial groups. Um, mm-hmm. But what what I see there is that kids were are expected to be a little more respectful, and mm-hmm. uh, and there are norms that are expected of them that I did not see in Israel. Israeli mm-hmm. kids have a little bit more audacity, and I think it's because they all go to the army, and therefore mm-hmm. it's a mandatory draft here. And and I have I have two sons in the army, uh, but it's therefore they kind of. The culture allows the kids to be a little bit more wild when they're younger. And there's a little bit less of that like adult child hierarchy respect kind of thing in this culture. And and then in Russia, the problem is ignored altogether. They're just like, oh. they, they, it's a bad kid. This is just a bad kid. <laughs> we need yeah. to put that kid, you know, put them into trade school as fast as we possibly can. And, and I think that's a throwback to communism because they, you weren't allowed to fail in communist yeah. schools. And therefore, you needed to quickly remove and separate the kids that might be problematic 
so that the rest of them could get their PhDs. And, and mm. so they did clear them out to trade schools. So they are in a completely different headspace than Israel or America. Right, right. So with ADHD in mind, are there some associated, uh, and I don't want to use the word disorders, but uh, just for simplicity, are there some associated things around there? If a kid has ADHD, may there also be something else that we need to look at? So often I'm seeing that kids, especially as they get older, are suffering with low self-esteem mm. and uh, also with social issues. And uh, mm. there's one big thing that we have to look at, and this is super dramatic, is, is the screen addictions. Because kids with what I call an instant gratification personality, those are the kids who are drawn into things that are exciting and fun and entertaining and kind of dangerous. So those are the kids who are A, going to find pornography immediately because they're looking for the dangerous. And yeah. uh, and they're also going to be very drawn into and get addicted to screens very, very quickly. That yeah. will lead, of course, to much worse symptoms. And uh, those kids with this instant gratification personality are often going to land up just stalling out in life because they have that screen in their mm -hmm. hands. Now, which is why I spend a tremendous amount of time working with parents on reducing screen time, protecting kids from the nastiness that we're being yeah. fed on the internet. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the child, and I want to go to adults in a moment because I'm a little later because children do become adults. They but, do. But with the focus on the child, um, who do you think has the responsibility of being the leader in trying to figure out is something going on with my child or the resources that may help my child? Is it the teacher? Is it the parent? Or would you say, you know, it's, they're both of them? Or, and are, they're others, you know, the rabbi? You know, this, right. I don't know. What would you say to that? Who so I'm definitely not, I'm not pulling the rabbi in here okay. or the priest. Okay. <laughs> they're out. For now, uh, I'm sure they're useful for something else. But what what I firmly believe as a mother and a teacher that this has to be a a group effort. And mm. I again, I, I spent a full chapter of my book helping parents build or teachers from either side build that bridge because this child's full time job is school, and therefore the teacher has the ability to give incredible perspective and depth of understanding about the child. And the parent also sees a different type of child at home. So if the teacher and the and the parent could get together, then they really can help the, the child. What I worry about is that both parent and teacher outsource it to the doctor, which yeah. in my opinion is not the right address. Right. It's it's easy, it's an easy solution, but I agree with you, it's not it's not the right address for sure. Um, so when then should a parent or teacher, you know, get to a point to say, you know, this child, we need additional resources. I don't want to call it treatment, but we need additional resources for this child. At what point would you say? The minute the child's not flourishing, the child mm. goes into first grade. I do not like when, and when a child is diagnosed in kindergarten, uh, because mm. the brain is really developing very quickly at that point. And there's a lot that a kindergarten teacher can do before getting to a place of diagnosis, teaching mm. a child, how to respect rules and, and routines. And there's so much to do at that young age. But let's say the kid's in first grade and not picking up reading right away and uh, kind of not getting the social norms, not understanding what's going on socially, having a hard time sitting for a long time, kind yeah. of not, being very disorganized. That's when we jump right in. Both parent and teacher yeah. should jump in right away and not yeah. diagnose but be yeah. curious and ask, what's going on for you? You're struggling. Why? Yeah. I love the way you put that, though. Be curious. I mean, we can get so much information by just being curious. So thank you for that. <laughs> but look here, I want, to, I want to get closer to this child now. And uh, I'm, I'm going to throw some things at you. And I want you to tell me if this is one of the things that parents and teachers should look for. Uh, I don't know whether to call this portrait of an ADHD child, I don't want to be, but you get what I'm saying? So I'm just going to throw some things out, okay? And I want you to okay. tell me if, you know, it's like a game that I want to play with you. So okay. the HDA child, okay, performance in school, is that an issue? Is that a, a question that a parent should look at? Absolutely. Okay, all right. 
relationships? Is there something there that we should look at? Oh, sure. The, the kids, like I said before, um, either they're very, very timid socially, or they're a little too aggressive socially, or they're missing tact altogether, meaning they are not understanding the rules of social engagement. And we got to mm -hmm. jump in right away. Because honestly, like I think post COVID era, where we see that schools are like, you know, they're kind of important, but not really. <laughs> Our kids have given up on schools. That's what I'm seeing after the post COVID. They're like, okay, we mm. don't need so much anymore. So the kids mm. are going to socialize. That's the main purpose mm. of school right now. And and if they can't figure out the socializing, we, we've got to get right in there and help them out. Oh gosh. I mean, I'll tell you what, and we overlook how important this is. I mean, it's because if you, if you are not able to, socialize and you know just interact with others it's going to affect everything you know really so, yeah everything yeah. yeah that's that's huge okay what about and uh and you can push back on me but what about early uh alcohol use or drug experimentation does that indicate anything that would indicate something off in the child's environment if the child uh -huh. turning Young children are not interested in 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 drugs and alcohol unless that, that is introduced okay. into their environment. So uh -huh. I would go straight environment and and check what's going on there, maybe with a social worker, and not pin that on the child himself. Yeah, yeah, himself. yeah. So it could be the home, something that they're seeing there. It could be bigger kids at school. You're saying that yeah. you know, yeah. Let's not immediately let's not take this leap and say oh this is ADHD this could be something else exactly I um, would not treat yeah. that as a sign of ADHD mm -hmm. I would treat that as danger 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 yeah, yeah. check this out oh, gosh. not something wrong with the kid you are good I love the way you put things I love the way the flashing you know I love that yeah take a look something is going on we don't know what it is that's for sure what about yeah I live in the United States and there are some children who are sent to special ed or juvenile detention. And I'm wondering, is this something, is there something going on other than it's a bad child? What would you say? Is juvies, juvenile detention, is that something that we need to take a look at as well? Yeah. For sure. And mm -hmm. there, there are two possibilities there. One is that this child, well, there are a few, I should not say two. Uh, we know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the ACEs study. That's the adverse childhood experience study. The more- yeah child has adverse experiences, abuse, neglect, alcohol in the house, divorce, uh, that we talked about before, the more that that child is going to turn to dangerous behavior and desperately try to get attention from the adults around them. Yeah. A uh -huh. lot of those kids land up in juvie. Not only mm. that, you're going to land up with uh, with kids that are in an environment where where the only people that they have to look up to and copy are also... Mm. Uh, leaning toward criminal activity. Children mm -hmm. will choose to do well if they can. And mm -hmm. the environment is the one that either is determining that the child can have that space to, to mm -hmm. make that good choice or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Abigail, how does trauma show up in this conversation? Or push back if you like, is trauma irrelevant to this conversation? Trauma is incredibly relevant to this conversation. And all of my adult, adult clients, every single one of them who has ADHD into adulthood has dealt with some kind of really serious adversity, yeah. uh, which, which lands up making them hold on to these symptoms straight into adulthood. A kid yeah. that is just a spontaneous, energetic kid without the trauma is going to grow out of their ADHD symptoms. Not the ones that are in trauma. That means growing up with uh, a parent with mental health issues, borderlines or narcissistic personalities, or growing up in an environment where there's danger uh, or or abuse. Those kids yeah. are going to develop all of the ADHD symptoms. And those symptoms are a call for help. And I teach yeah. teachers. I'm lucky enough to, to teach in a, a teacher's college, a job I really, really love. And I say yeah. to them, if you misdiagnose trauma, as ADHD, and then you medicate the kid, what you're saying to the kid is, the problem is in your head, not in yeah. your environment. And that child oh can't heal. And we're kicking the can down the road and causing post-trauma. So we yeah. had better be really careful to check if that child's being traumatized before we, God forbid, ever consider giving that child a pill. 
Yeah, I tell you, I think we adults often forget that children face a lot of adversity that can be traumatic. And then we make these assumptions about, you know, being something else. Uh, so, right. yeah, um, gosh. Okay, so what about, I mean, we talk, we've talked about the child now, but what about the families? How does, uh, let, let me roll back. Is ADHD a mental health issue? No. Okay. And it's not a mental health issue, but uh, for certain circumstances, it can become one. And I'll tell you mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, kids who take uh, drugs for ADHD, uh, one in 10 of them lends up developing a secondary psychiatric condition. So that mm -hmm. becomes a mental health issue. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is well diagnosed. That's in my second book, Show Me the Science. And mm -hmm. then the, the other issue is if that child is abused for the symptoms and not understood, and not received as they are and educated correctly with love, with acceptance, mm -hmm. with kindness, then they can develop depression, anxiety, oh, low self-esteem. But the yeah. actual symptoms themselves should not lead to a mental mm -hmm. health condition. Yeah, understood. I mean, I, I, I hear you. I could see how it could happen if a parent is not conscious, not aware, uh, the child you know, is being told things that was wrong with you. You know, right. or something is wrong with you, uh, you know, that could certainly cause a secondary secondary problem. Yeah, so, um, but I can see though, even though it's not a mental health issue, we know that families are affected by people who have, you know, mental health issues. So how are families affected by kids who may have this issue, ADHD? So I'll give you an example uh, from a, a little client of mine who uh, um, it was not being managed very well, discipline-wise, by the parents. And we've reversed that. And, and that's yeah. a big deal because the child is waiting mm -hmm. to be disciplined. We tend to under-discipline kids with ADHD because we get scared of them because they are mm -hmm. capable of doing the craziest stuff. So this kid took cans of paint and a hammer and painted up the whole house and then mm -hmm. smashed the walls with a hammer. That affects everybody in the family. The other yeah. brothers and sisters get panicked, get scared. Kids with ADHD symptoms can be much more aggressive. So you have younger siblings who land up being the victims of this child who cannot rein in their behavior. Now, when I say cannot, I'm actually uh, making a mistake. They are not right now. Are every single person with ADHD capable of learning mm -hmm. proper behavior in the family and learning discipline? Absolutely. But mm -hmm. what we have mm -hmm. to do, it's kind of like a, a chiropractor gives like a back adjustment. Yeah. What we have to do is, and, and this is very clear, I want to say this to all the parents out there, as a mother of a lot of kids with ADHD, it's not our fault. We did not mm. cause the symptoms. But mm. what's amazing about us is that we have incredible power mm -hmm. to help the children readjust. We have to be those chiropractors mm -hmm. to readjust. And in this particular family, the parents were being very gentle on discipline and pulling back and kind of bribing the kid to behave. And we switched mm -hmm. that entire thing around. We made house rules. We made consequences. And the child within a week calmed yeah. down. But sure, uh, siblings will definitely suffer if this is yeah. not attended to properly. Yeah. Um, you know, that's beautiful because I can just imagine, you know, a Especially today, when parents want to be good parents, we will yeah. be, you know, we want to do things, all of this stuff. But sometimes, and I think this is a part of what you're saying, that a kid will benefit from structure, and to also understand that there could be some consequences, you know, not corporal punishment per se, but, no, but to certain none people. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I like that. So okay, all right. So what shows up big in your practice from the little? that I, investigation that I did is raising healthy children because it's like, I said, oh, she's really, she's telling parents, like, we want to, you know, your kids can flourish. You can raise a healthy child with ADHD. So let's, let's look at this for a moment. So your kid has ADHD. First step, pharmaceuticals, yes or no? No, definitely um, not. Because uh, like I said, the science is, is lagging behind here. Even in the very best studies on ADHD, they have managed to find, this is 2017, they managed to find out that 
maybe 5% of children diagnosed with ADHD have even perhaps something wrong with their brain. And what they didn't do was separate out the kids that have been medicated and kids who had not been medicated. Mm -hmm. So there's all these big headlines about the brain being wired wrong and there being less dopamine, yeah. all that stuff in the five different areas of the brain that are different. That's in a non-statistically significant number of children, which means that if you're a parent of a kid with ADHD, the chances that your child's brain is healthy is 95%. So Ooh. don't go to the brain first. Don't, yeah. don't start there. First, investigate. I always invite parents to take a week to study their children. And they're saying that's ridiculous. Yeah. We live with our child. I said, yeah. study your children in a non-judgmental, non-aggressive mm -hmm. way. Just look yeah. at him. What causes him or her to explode? What are yeah. those things? What's your discipline like? How does that child yeah. respond to compliments, the discipline? Yeah. So definitely the first step is never going to be medication. Yeah. I mean, sometimes a child may just need to know that they're loved or may just need a big hug or, you know, people's behavior change when they're treated in a certain way, for sure. Um, okay. But what does a parent do? The parent is saying, you know, I'm not a doc. I don't have MD or DO, you know, beside my name. The doctor comes in and says, your child has uh, a chemical imbalance in the brain and it's H ADHD and I prescribe Ritalin. What does a parent, how can a, how can a parent fight that? Well, so I invite parents and, and myself included to mm -hmm. always investigate anything that anyone tells me about my child. So let's mm -hmm. say a doctor gives me a list of of you know 72 doses of vaccines so should i just say sure doc or should i mm. say well what's this one for and what's that one for and is this the age appropriate to receive that one or so my in my approach i say we need to ask we need to ask questions about everything because we are our children's only advocate and uh. where maybe vaccines were are great for the majority of kids is it the mm. right thing for me. Maybe yeah. ADHD medication works for X amount percentage, but that's a percentage. Mm. My child's an individual. So I yeah. was gifted with this child, or in my case, these six children, and they're mm. mine to protect. Yeah. And that's my job. I can't outsource that job. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, that's just absolutely beautiful. And I think the same applies to all of us. Uh, we go to a doctor, the doctor says, well, you got this problem, here's this drug. We should be asking questions. Wait a minute, is that the first step? You know, or are yeah. there some other things that I can look at? Yeah. And just, so, just yeah. recently, I'll give you an example. I, I, I was speaking uh -huh. to an older gentleman who is, is having some heart problems mm -hmm. and he's been put on three anticoagulants where he's nearly mm -hmm. bled to death because because he was, his blood was just turned to water. And, and the, here's the issue. The doctor never told him that the reason he's having heart issues is because he's incredibly overweight. And that is a lifestyle problem. That's yeah, not, that, yeah. that could be resolved with a lifestyle uh, solution. Yeah. And that's mm. something that the person should be investigating themselves. Your body's your temple. Pay yeah. attention, take care of it. And then you might not run into a stent needed, needing to be put in. You might yeah, actually yeah. be able to live healthy. And the same yeah. thing with the children. Yeah, that's, you know, every, look, I tell you what, I, I'm just being my, my, I'm just becoming more, I don't know what it is. I just, there's something about what you're saying just so resonates with me, you know, because I think we're living at a time when it's changing, by the way, when the easy answer is an RX. That's the easy answer. But you just said, look, you know, you could have a lifestyle issue. <laughs> Change your diet. <laughs> oh, yeah. get another pill, and if you, you look know, at so, the yeah. ADHD kids, very often oh. it's a diet issue. It's the fact that the child is never exposed to natural sunlight and a forest yeah. or yeah. exercise. Like those oh, are lifestyle issues. Get the kid to run around the schoolyard and look at a tree. You might yeah. get a calmer kid. Yeah, you may be so. I, as a boy, we walked around bare feet all the time. It doesn't happen as much. In fact, it doesn't even happen in the country these days. Children don't run around bare feet. And that could fit no. in there at, at, no, as no. well. We, we've been talking about children, Abigail, but children become adults. Uh, how do adults handle ADHD? How has your first child flourish, which is a big line for you? You can be yes. healthy and they can flourish. Yeah. 
So actually my daughter, my oldest was the one who got hit by COVID the hardest. She was, mm. in college, she, it hit her at college. So she's still, uh, and then we had a little war. So her college um, path was very, very bumpy and mm. she's still trying to finish college. And that's not, that hasn't been her fault. So she's still looking for her path, but overall she has a much more awareness and friend groups and, and she's able to take control of her life and make good choices. And uh, thank God I've seen across the board, I already have three adult children. Um, oh. One is the mother of my of my uh, first grandchild. I keep mentioning Congratulations. it. Congratulations. Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I said, like, <laughs> had I known this was going to be so great, I would have skipped right to being grandparent. <laughs> but he's, he's oh. just really the light of our lives. Anyway, yeah. so she's, she, was, she was the kid that I got called every day to come get her at school, come discipline her, come yell at her, come tie her mm, to the seat, mm, whatever. She made mm, everyone crazy. She once mm, got up in the middle of class and said, everybody stop listening to the teacher and just mm, listen to me. And I'm like, oh God, yeah. that's my child. God bless. But yeah. anyway, she is a responsible adult. She actually, this is interesting. And I, and I think this is mm. very interesting for you to hear. After yeah. a very not successful, lackluster elementary school career, I sent her to a performing arts high school. She's a dancer and a mm. very talented dancer. And uh, she went from getting at very average grades mm. to being at the top of her class. She'd start the day with ballet and then she'd have a math class and then she'd go to modern dance. And she was in a leotard all day long. And that oh, boost of exercise and energy completely focused her. And her matriculation exam, she just floated right through them. She's just a mm. bright kid. And it was all yeah. being covered up by this these difficult symptoms. And the dancing is what solved that problem for her. And as an adult, she's a yoga instructor. She has a wow. degree in, uh, in, um, in uh, it's uh, nutrition. And uh -huh. she's really focused. So the kids are really, really flourishing in adulthood. But yeah. then you have the flip side. Most of my clients are coming to me after having lost five, six jobs, mm -hmm. having trouble in their relationships mm -hmm. and uh, not managing to raise their own children calmly and feeling mm -hmm. an extremely low self-esteem. And we've got mm -hmm. to dig back to yeah. 50, 20 layers of emotional stress that this person yeah. went through in order to get them to make the changes they need. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I want to talk about your books. Um, uh, so uh, I I want to talk about they both have the primary title hyper healing. Yeah, it's a series. Uh, first one. Yep, I'm sorry. It's a series. I wanted to make sure that they oh. were connected. Will there be more? Will there be more? Oh goodness, I don't even know. I keep telling everyone, okay. no, and then I keep like percolating, and I'm like, no, no, no. no quiet it down. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I, I tell you what, I love, and and when I write the show notes, the title. I'm going to include hyperhealing somehow in there. I, I saw that. I thought, wow, when did that come to you? Hyperhealing. <laughs> it was it was kind of funny because I was looking for a title and yeah. uh, and I was working with a graphic artist and I I kind of was writing all sorts of ideas. And then I wrote and I wrote hyper and then healing as two separate words and then went to sleep. And I woke up in the morning and he wrote back to me. I love it. Hyper healing. And I looked yeah. back at it and saw that I hadn't put a space between them. And, uh -huh. uh, and I had by mistake put them together. And I was like, wow, okay. I don't believe yeah. in mistakes. I believe that, yeah. you know, things are directed from above. And oh, uh, that's it, wonderful. it really resonates with me because uh, we always think that the hyper needs to be healed. And often the, the, the hyper is the healing and, uh, uh -huh. and we do not, not be trying to heal children, but rather accept them as the full package. Yeah. Uh, well, I tell you, it hit me. I mean, it just hit me. Whoa. There was a way that I could have just avoided that. I can't tell you why, but it just struck a chord. Okay. So the, the secondary title of the first book is The Empowered Parents Complete Guide to Raising a Healthy Child with ADHD Symptoms. There's the what, symptom. Yeah. <laughs> I love that word, by the way. That's I'll never refer to it with and with disorders again, ever. Thanks to you. So what do you just give us a window, a brief glimpse what parents can get when once they get this book and look, buy this book. 
It's going to change your life. What will parents get from this, Abigail? So I actually was a reluctant writer. I did not want to write a book. And what I realized at some point was that I had no choice because there are so many people in the world who cannot afford coaching. And because of that, their children are just being medicated and they're not being respected. And the parents are not getting the understanding and the children are being lost in a system and might land up in juvie and might land up in prison. And are, are and, and that's such a shame because it, yeah. you should not be held back from high level inter, um, intervention programs because you can't afford to fork out $150 a week to help your child. So therefore, what I did was take my entire program, the whole intervention program from beginning to end, the same thing I do mm -hmm. with people who pay me a lot of money to coach them. And I put yeah. it in a book and I wrote it in a way that every single chapter is very clear with an action plan at the end and a cheat sheet for the parents who have ADHD themselves so that they never have to go back and read the chapter. They mm -hmm. have the notes right there in the book. Mm -hmm. And I go through all of the different causes of ADHD symptoms. And what I guarantee you, if your child has these ADHD symptoms, you will find your child in the book. I'll be talking about mm. him or her. Mm. And, uh, and you'll be able to find a very hands-on program of mm. intervention right away. And I, I always recommend to parents who buy the book to, to buy it in a group. Make a little church group, make a little synagogue group, just a friend group, read it chapter by chapter together, make a little WhatsApp group and, and decide together, we're going to tackle this action plan this week and go through it, take a year, take your time. And as a community, you'll find that you give each other strength and encouragement and your children will just really be transformed. It's oh, not a miracle. It so That's the thing. Parents say, oh my God, it's a miracle. My kid's doing so well. Yeah. Say it's not a miracle. It's your incredible dedication and hard work as a parent. Oh, I just love it, Abigail. And I love the way what you advertise in this secondary title, the empowered parent. So you parent will be empowered. It's a complete guide. And you'll also learn ways to raise healthy children with ADHD symptoms. I, you got to love that. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Nothing this, like healthy the second, children. <laughs> yeah, the second one is, the second one is also, it's like, it's like you get, it's like, I'm, a, I'm just making an assumption. It's like you get these inspirations. It's, these are inspired top uh, titles. This is why they hit me this way. It's like, this stuff came from a different world. Show me the science, you said. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, making sense of your child's ADHD diagnosis. I love it. Show me the science. Go ahead, Abigail. Give us a good So that to comes, that comes from deep in my gut. That was that mm. that's well, the show me the science is full of emotion. I could guarantee mm. that. Because as a mom, I do not feel like I was treated with respect because I was mm. not given all the information. I was not directed to studies. I was not told that long-term medication could harm my child's brain. Uh -huh. Now that doesn't happen to all children. But I didn't know about that. And not only that, I was being told about my child's broken brain, but I was not, but that was not even accurate. So mm. what, like I said before, if I'm my child's only advocate, I had better know what's going on. And I think yeah. it's irresponsible for us as parents to not understand what's going on in the brain. Is it yeah. really imbalanced? Is that really what's happening? Well, turns out it's not. And I only found that out 10 years into my ADHD uh, journey with my children. Mm -hmm. And then what do these medications do to my child's brain? Is it positive? Yeah. Is it negative? So I'm not telling anybody what to do in the book at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. even mentioned in the book that I, I medicated three of my children for different lengths of time. And uh, so therefore, I'm not a purist. What I want is to do what's best for my child. So I walk parents through all the information. At the end of this book, you will finally be fully educated. And mm -hmm. therefore, you can speak to the doctor, the teacher, the principal mm -hmm. with full authority and be able to ask questions, answer questions, and make decisions from a place of, of security and power. I love it. And I love your transparency. And, I, you know, you're right. I mean, sometimes a pharmaceutical is useful. 
you know, for this particular moment in time, but it doesn't have to be a life sentence, you know? So right. I love that as well. Um, you also, um, and, and this may be out of context, maybe we've already talked about it, but I've seen the hyper healing method. Is there more that you want to tell us about that? It, I saw that and I thought, wow, what follows? I mean, what's that method? Is there a methodology here? Sure. The method begins with a very intensive intake, a thousand questions. That's where mm. we begin. The method begins mm. with, it, it's a journey and it begins with what's your full story? I want to know if the child was born by C-section, if the child has asthma, allergies, autism, or any uh, or, or autoimmune conditions, it doesn't all have to start with A. You can also have conditions that are not started with an A. But I want to know everything about the, the child's physical, mental, spiritual background. So the methodology mm -hmm. builds from there. Once I've gathered all the information from the parent, and in these books, I'm talking from a perspective of parent to child, although a lot of adults have used my books for themselves mm -hmm. and they've re-raised themselves, which is something I highly recommend, especially if you've gone through trauma and you haven't received that love and that and that affirmation that you're just good because you exist mm -hmm. um, from a young age. So mm -hmm. re-raising yourself in that loving embrace, it has to happen. But the methodology mm -hmm. continues after that uh, very intensive intake we go to root causes of ADHD mm -hmm. symptoms based on our understanding. And mm -hmm. then we're going to look at this holistic picture of, mm -hmm. are we looking at something physiological or, or psychological or, or something in the environment. And from there, we, and the final part of this is that instead of the parents having to come back to me for me to give them guidance, I'm turning the parent into the coach. And yeah. the parent, I, I just hand over all my skills to the parent who take it you enjoy it, and 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 now you're in charge. So that's oh, that's, 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 that's 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 great. That's so great. Um, so are you still in the classroom? Are you still you still teaching? So right now, I'm not teaching kids. I'm teaching teachers. Uh -huh. And I okay. love that. Too. I love my students. It's an incredible process because they start the semester angry at me because I start presenting the science, and it's exactly the opposite of anything they've ever heard, even though. Oh. The people they've heard it from weren't presenting the signs. So they are just ready to like, you know, kill. What are you talking about? It, you're yeah. so wrong. And then we make it through the semester and we end as best friends. And yeah. uh, and they start using and implementing my programs in their classrooms, in their homes, if, if they're parents. And uh, it's just a wonderful process. That's fantastic. Um, so, uh, so you work with, do you still work with parents as a coach? Yeah. Yeah, That's so I answer. not only do I work with the parents as a coach, I also do online courses. I'm actually just now launching a free course, a three uh, three uh, part series for people who want to lead these groups that like I was talking about before. A parent inviting other parents to join the group, so I give them skills to lead that group using the mm -hmm. hyperdeal method as their guideline. Uh, so I, I offer that for free, so that mm -hmm. again, and I and I'm inviting them to not be charging a lot of money because I'm giving them my time for free. So hopefully wow. when they open these groups, again, the, the people that can afford can join a group and, and get that mm. benefit. Well, Abigail, I'm so glad you're out there making a difference, a positive difference in the world. It has been a joy talking with you today. Thank you so much for making space for me. Thank you so much. This has been an incredible and fun conversation. I so appreciate it. Okay. Well, you've been listening to the Possibility Action Network podcast. Our guest today has been Abigail Gimpel. I'm your host, Stephen Middleton. Until next time, good day. You are not alone, just keep going.